coming out to let the Life's a Beach event. Um, we're going to get started very shortly, Phil, to um, mix and mingle, kind of get up from your seats if you don't mind, to get to know some of the other young ladies and women in here, and some gentlemen are in here as well. Um, and we'll get started very shortly, okay? Thank you. So everybody came to my house to get dressed, and everybody came to my house to get their hair done, and their makeup done. My mom used to be like, they use you, girl. And I didn't realize it until they used me. And I, you know, it hurt my feelings. So um, I think how you know it's your friend is that there's a lot of reciprocity, and what reciprocity means is if I give you something, you give me something in return. It, it's the big word for give and take. You want to go into friendships with people that you are not always the one calling first or texting first. And you're not the only one letting them borrow your shoes or whatever. You want to be a good friend, but you also want to recognize when somebody's not returning it to you. So I'll say, you know what your, your real friend when it, when it feels genuine. Um, always listen to your parents because it kind of gives a sixth sense of who's good and who's bad. And, and you can follow your intuition, your gut, that little voice that tells you no, listen to it. Because that's God and that's what we have as females. It's called a superpower, it's your intuition. And it'll help you when it's time to decide who's there for you and who's not. Hello? Mm -hmm. okay. We have two mics. That's okay. 
Um, so I think exactly what the two ladies just said just now. I think a friend is someone who's not going to make you judge your own character. And just like Sheena said, everyone has that intuition. You have a gut feeling when someone's truly not your, your friend. You're either trying too hard to be their friend, you don't like hanging around them, you feel uncomfortable around them, you may second guess your intuition, your morals, and your values. So friends aren't going to test those things. Friends allow you to have a different opinion. You have a friend who always wants you to go along with what they're saying, what they're doing, although you know it's not the right thing, that's not a friend. So I think the biggest thing is being true to yourself, especially going into the school year. You have some of the same friends, you'll meet new people. It's okay to do either. But it's most important to stay true to who you are. Your parents taught you certain things, morals, values, staying true to you and not deflecting from that. And when you feel like you need to deflect from that, just to be friends with someone, they're not your friend. And like Sheena said, it was me hanging out with my cousins and family and my sisters. Those are my friends, my church family. And you'll get a sense of who your friends are aside from those people. So one, stay true to you. you your parents taught you who you were. Be who you are. Don't change for anyone. It's okay, it's okay to learn and to grow, but friends typically allow you to do that. So make sure you're picking the right people to be friends with. Everyone has made some awesome points, um, and I, I want to go back and highlight um, that we do use the word friend very loosely, especially with social media. Um, you know, started way back with Facebook when you just have like a gazillion friends, and then you look around on your birthday, there's only five people at the table. Um, I think it's important. When I was growing up, I remember my mom always correcting me when I would call somebody my friend, and she'd say, No, that's your acquaintance. Right? That's your peer. And I used to roll my eyes and get annoyed because I thought that that person was my friend. But um, what I did learn through that was that there are levels to friendship. And that's okay. It's okay for somebody that you see in school to be like your school friend. Somebody that maybe you hang out with in just that one class. Just because you guys see eye to eye in that one class. And then you have, you know, people who you may walk to different classes with. You may eat lunch with them, they may be at your table, they may, you know, be people that you hang out with just at school, and then you have the, your real friends, you know, when something's going on at home, or you, the person that you tell your dreams to, you know, that you know, again, that person who would feed, feed your dreams, and they'll say, really? Oh, wow, I always wanted to do that too, or um, that sounds like a great idea, and encourage you rather than, you know, put you down. Um, I think that that was a great point um, to, to highlight is what are people saying when you share your secrets or when you share, you know, important things, things that you value. If you share that you want to become a chef or when you share you want to become, you know, a veterinarian, are they feeding your dream and saying, oh, wow, like, that's awesome, that's great. Or are they saying, girl, you can't do that. Girl, you're doing too much. Like, how are you going to do that, you know? So the language piece, I think, is really important. And yeah. Thank you, lady. All right, next we're gonna get into self-image. Almost all teenage girls say they like to change at least one aspect of their physical appearance, with weight being at the top of the list. Now, I've been out of high school for 10 years now, and I remember thinking I was tech, you know, overweight, and now I'm like, no, now you're next. But um, now that you ladies are out of school, have been out of school for some time, how do you view teenage youth? And how has your body changed? You know, were you part of your success? I'm 100, so let me try to think back. Um, okay, I always thought I was decent. I, I always thought I was like beautiful, um, I grew up with people telling me I was beautiful. My grandmother, my great grandmother is like the epitome of glamour. I grew up wearing her fur coats and high heels and jewelry and dancing to like songs like Wait a Minute, it's the postman. And y'all don't even probably know that at all. But I used to dance to like oldies in the mirror and, and jewels. So I think that I always thought I was beautiful on, on the outside and on the inside. I, I was a writer since I was six. So I used to write, um, 
beautiful things about myself. And I used to get in trouble from my mom because I used to write like, you're beautiful on the top of my mirror. And stuff that people are like, it's really popular now, like, you know, like affirmations and, and saying things to make yourself feel better. I was doing that at six years old. Um, so I think that when I was young, before a teenager, I had like really good, I mean, like a good thought. I thought I was pretty, but then I went to, high school wasn't a problem. I cut my hair off, Tony Braxton had just came out. Y'all probably don't even know who that is. <laughs> but I had long hair and I wanted my hair like Tony Braxton. So I cut my hair really, really short in ninth grade and I dyed it blind like Amber Rose. Like imagine how Amber Rose hair is. That's how my hair was in high school. And I was the most, the tallest, most bald-headed girl in high school and I was confident. I knew that I could carry it and I felt beautiful and I didn't ever feel ugly until college. When I went to college, um, I didn't even realize that I was licensed until I went to college, honestly. I went to college, um, I went to a um, mixed school, I went to IUP, and um, it was like clicky. It was like, I didn't have any, like none of my friends from high school went to college with me, and I, and I purposely did that. I'm like, I want to explore, I want to meet new people, and um, I went to college. We did like a summer program, and I met a couple like older people. And we, they were cool, but I had, um, I never thought I was not pretty until I went to college. Um, I had like a whole group of girls who was like, well, she thinks she cute because she likes men. Or all like men. This in college, they would be like, all ice cream girls ain't pretty. You ain't pretty just because you like men. And I'm like, I'm like men? Because it never was an issue in high school. No one ever made comments about my complexion. So um, in college, I, I used to call my sister at my college was like six hours away and she would drive six hours to my school because I would be bald crying like why don't they like me? They keep calling like they would literally have meetings about why they didn't like me. It was the most torturous two years of my life. And um, I think I, I, of course I like I said I was I used to write a lot and I used to read a lot. So I started being attracted to reading other people's stories, like all biography. And I read this one lady's story, her name is um, Cupcake Brown. The book is called A Piece of Cake. Um, and she she ended up being a successful lawyer, but she was like abused and ridiculed all her life, and she ended up like picking herself up by her bootstraps, and that is what kind of like gave me encouragement to like feel pretty again. Like I realized in college that it doesn't matter what other people's definition of what pretty is or what beautiful is, and it wasn't even like a body thing. Because I, I honestly never felt bad about myself until then. So um, my words to you guys is just, you know, you have to be very, very honest about how you feel about yourself. And even if it's something small, like, like how I used to write, I'm beautiful. Tell yourself to be beautiful every day. And beauty is really from the inside out. So you always, you want to be kind. And then that kindness comes out in your physical, but never let anybody make you feel like just because you're not the same height or the same complexion or have short hair or long hair or you like skin or dark, you know what I mean? Like, it's hard because I, I, didn't, it didn't, I didn't go through it until I was 18 years old, but I know it's hard. And I know some of you guys might have like insecurities or whatever, but as an adult, I will say, I went through having children and not feeling as beautiful as I used to be. So I, I've used words to encourage myself, I, I'm very spiritual, so I, I read the Bible, and I encourage myself to words in my own writing and meditation too, but yeah, I didn't feel ugly until college, but I'm pretty, I feel pretty again, so. <laughs> so it was probably an obvious thing for me because all through high school, like, I'm the tallest girl, and I got thick eyebrows, my mom won't let me get my eyebrows hurt. I play basketball, I play I'm hanging out with only boys, so, and this is fun when I'm in seventh grade, eighth grade, and I get to the ninth grade, and like girls are more girly, and like they kind of grown at 13, and I'm trying to dress like a boy. And so, I fit, I fit in with my friends because um, they were from my neighborhood, and then we got to the 10th grade, my friends were no longer in my class, and I see, wait, like, now we're a little older, we're 15, they're getting more girlier, and I'm still dressing like a boy. So one girl, I like this boy in my class, and I was telling my girl, like, I really like Bobby, his name is Bobby. And she was like, Bobby ain't gonna like you because you look like you dressed him. I'm like, Bobby, well, help me out. You feel that way. So I started trying to be more girly, and I did not like it at all. Like, she would put weaves on my hair, weave ponytails, all this geeky stuff. I would feel so uncomfortable and so awkward because now I'm out of my element. I don't like it. Like, I'm just a tomboy. 
So my whole high school year was just terrible. I told, I said, I got um, my girlfriend to tell Bobby I liked him. Bobby was like, uh, no. So I went right back dressed like a boy. I'm not like me. This didn't work. I'm going back and dressing with my you know, basketball shorts, my dicky pants. But then when I got to um, college, I went with the chain. And I feel like it, what was so different was now you were in school with so many different people. And I could be a tomboy, but now I'm, I'm more older, so I'm getting more girly, but it was no pressure. It was no pressure. I still played basketball, I still ran track, and afterwards I was able to dress like a girl. And the pressure because I still feel like it's so easy for us to do that with our friends. Everything my friends just tell me, they're like, you should bring your hair like this, you should dress like this, you should do this. I'm like, all right. And I didn't like it. It was making me uncomfortable. But when I got to school, when I got to change that year, I felt like finally I could be myself, finally what other people. And I didn't know nobody. I had like two friends. So I went to school there. None of my friends went to because they all knew cuts you know, I'm like, you know, I'm going to change because then I can keep you and still go to work every single day. But when I got to school in college, like I felt I felt so much better and less pressure than how I felt when I was in high school. So don't be so hard on yourself because it's always going to be somebody out there telling you that maybe you should change this about you yourself. Maybe you should do this differently or you should bring your hair like this. Do what's always going to make you comfortable, make you feel happy because at the end of the day, you got to live with you. So I guess what all some of the ladies said, so for me growing up, I grew up in a predominantly Latina community. So I grew up in Reading, Pennsylvania. A lot of Latinos, not many black girls that looked like me. I can name them maybe in two hands. Um, so for me, it was one of the bigger booties. I know the Latinas that were around me. Um, and then for me, I was a tall girl. So the thing that I struggled with was because I was so tall, it was hard finding clothes for myself. So I found myself where my mom buy me like Eddie Bauer, things that just weren't popping in. Like I didn't wear apple bottoms, I didn't wear tins. It was things that big girls could wear. I wore a size 10 shoe. I played basketball, which was great. Um, so I got involved in sports. Um, so for me, it was my height. Um, and then the second thing is, like I said, not seeing many black girls that looked like me. I was always confident in who I was. My grandma, my mom, they always instilled just com being confident. And for me, being a dark-skinned black girl in the predominantly Latina community, um, at times, it could have been difficult, but um, it wasn't. I always embraced being a dark-skinned girl. And I remember, maybe a few years ago, Oprah came out with that documentary, Dark Skinned Girls, and some of the things that I heard on it, I just couldn't believe it. It was like, wow, people are really dealing with colorism. Black people are dealing with colorism. And we're all just black people. So, um, for me, it was my height and the awkward clothes I had to wear because of my height. Luckily, I played basketball. Um, but it's a, being confident in who you are. Like Sheena said, no matter the size, the height. Um, and this might sound cliche, but God created you perfectly the way you are. Now, there are things that you can change possibly to be healthy, to be confident, and that's okay. We all want something that we would like to change, but it's being 100% who you are. Um, because, then, again, back to what Keisha said, social media. I feel like social media is a big issue right now, especially for young girls. You see the Kim K's, you see girls that don't look like you, you want to look like those women. Some of those women have got alterations, that's okay too. But be confident in who you are. Um, don't let social media make you feel like you're not enough. Don't let boys make you feel like you're not enough. Or girls that make you feel like you're not enough. Um, and some of us don't hear positive affirmations from our parents. Um, sometimes it's hard for parents to say, I love you, you're beautiful, you're fine the way you are, because they may be dealing with some low self-esteem low self as well, not getting that affirmation from their parents. So, like Sheena said, read, write, get involved, be creative, love you, be confident in you, and it sounds cliche again, but you're perfect the way you are. God created you. That's the biggest gift that you can have. I'm like no one else in this world. My personality, my looks, my body. Um, you can change those things if you want to, but just be happy with who you are, especially going into the new school year, if you're already in school. Um, again, don't let anyone define who you are when the only person that can give you the consent for who you are is yourself. I think that this is probably one of the biggest topics um, just because beauty is, I mean, it's all around us. It's everything, right? It's one of the largest industries um, and it's always something that 
we're on a journey for even as adult women. Um, and I have no problem being transparent and sharing that. Like it's always a thing. You're always thinking about yourself because as women, our bodies are constantly changing. I mean, we don't get a break. <laughs> Um, you can go from getting ready to get on your cycle and gain five to ten pounds, get an acne, you know, it's just you're going through puberty or maybe different transitions. Our bodies are constantly changing. And then when your metabolism starts slowing down, you can pick up more weight, you have a kid, your body completely changes. And so one thing that I've had to learn is like, okay, I cannot attach my worth to my body. I cannot. I cannot attach my emotions to my body because my body will always betray me. I will never have like that day where I wake up and I'm never extra critical about my body. That's something that I'm trying to work on is being less critical and letting it go because so much of what was communicated to me growing up was around how you look because as young girls, you know, I grew up in a family where, you know, you had to make sure your legs were closed, you had to make sure your clothes fit you properly, you had to make sure your hair was done, you know, make sure that you're kept. And that can take a lot of time and it can consume a lot of space in your brain. And then you're chasing this idea of perfectionism and we're not perfect. We're not perfect beings. I appreciate Ashley for sharing that God created us perfectly imperfect, you know, so that like, we may feel like, according to beauty standards, that we're supposed to have, you know, the perfect breast, that skinny, skinny waist, the hip, the butt, you know, all of that. Social media does a great job of, like, making you feel bad about why your stomach isn't flat enough and why your butt's not juicy enough and all this kind of stuff. When the reality is those people, their bodies don't look like that either in real life. Um, and so, uh, for my personal experience, my struggle was what Jasmine was sharing about weight. I struggled with weight growing up. I grew up in a family that cooked very, very well. And so, we liked to eat. And um, because I was creative, I was performing arts, I was theater, I wasn't very athletic. And, um, and so, I wasn't, really, I wasn't really healthy. And I wasn't... Um, confident about how I looked either. Um, and so I leaned more on academics, I leaned more on like my vocal, like, my voice, my acting, dancing, those kinds of things to kind of, co you know, cover up the outside that I didn't feel comfortable with. I wasn't the kind of girl whose mom allowed her to like, you know, dressed in all these different kinds of ways that you see on TV. My mom was like, no, you're 13, you're dressed like a 13 year old. Um, and so, you know, you have girls at school and they're wearing weaves all down, you know, their backs and all these different kinds of things and you don't quite look like that. Or you're comparing yourself to somebody that's like 25 or 30 and you're not supposed to look like that. Um, and so I think that what's important and what I wish that I kind of kept in perspective was like even the people who played my age on TV weren't really my age in real life. Like, you know, I love watching Back then it was like Sister Sister and Moesha and you know Saved by the Bell and Clueless and all these shows that are being played as teenagers, but they're adults playing them. And so their bodies are 25, their faces are 25, what they're allowed to do to their bodies and what they're allowed to do to their faces with makeup and things like that, that's because they're 25 years old. Um, even now when we watch movies and things like that, they're portraying teenagers. But in real life, they're 25, 30 years old. Um, and so that's something to kind of keep in mind as we you know, think about putting our world into perspective and even our social media world into perspective um, that allow yourself um, to be a teenager, allow yourself to be a kid, a young person, and be okay with that meaning you looking awkward sometimes. You get a pass. Uh, to look awkward, to be a little weird, and do your own thing and find your way, um, because you will. Thank you, ladies. Next, we are getting into cyberbullying. Um, cell phones, the internet, and social media apps weren't at our fingertips growing up. But like you, many of us as adults also experience online bullying, hateful comments, trolls, fake pages. How do you ladies, how would you ladies, deal with online bullying. 
<laughs> but um, I feel really like honestly, like I'm gonna just be super, super honest. I feel so bad for y'all, like this new generation. Like I feel like y'all got robbed of being a kid. Um, I feel like um, sometimes it's the parents' fault. Like, and I'm not speaking from out of the woods. I have a 16 year old, I'll say that. I have a son who's 16 and I have a daughter who's seven. And um, I parent my children like super, super different. My son just was allowed to get Instagram um, when he turned 16. He had one at 15, but he just was allowed to have one at 16. Um, and he was allowed to have Snapchat at 15. But if he was a girl, he still wouldn't have it. But that's just me. I just feel like I feel really, really bad. Like if y'all wanna, like anything happen, like y'all can always DM me on Instagram and I promise I'll talk you through any horrible situation because I feel like social media, like what we was just talking about, image, we, I'm 36 and I still, and I get irritated from social media. Like people bother me, people, I have a daughter with special needs and I do a lot of advocating for my daughter via social media and people say, call my daughter retarded in my DM and tell, like they do all kinds of stuff. I mean, and I can block them, I'm a grown up, so I don't, I don't cry about it, but I can just imagine what type of things y'all have to deal with and I feel so bad, like I wish it was something that we as older people could do to kind of like shield y'all from it, but um, it really just goes back to another person's insecurities. You know what I mean? Like if a y'all, someone that you trust about it, if you're a bully, figure out why you're bullying. Um, think about your confidence level, why you're bullying someone, what you feel uncomfortable about that you feel like you do need to bully someone else. And uh, parents and adults be open to the feedback that young adults give you, and teens give you, when they do feel like there's a concern, and be honest with them and allow them to be honest with you. Open up that bridge of a relationship and communication. So I'm gonna be honest with you guys. Um, I have a love-hate relationship with social media because I, I recognize and acknowledge that it, they are awesome platforms for engaging with people in general. Um, anything from you know seeing what happened on the red carpet to seeing what party your friend went to last night to whatever you're interested in. Um, but I do feel like it's a world of its own that can suck you in for um, <laughs> a really negative in really negative ways. And I I promise you, I have I am on social media. I have tons of friends who are on social media, and um, so I'm not here to like bash or tell you guys don't get on Instagram, don't get on Snapchat, and all that kind of stuff. But I am here to caution you against the ways um, in which you allow social media to impact your, your reality. Because it's an alternate reality. Literally, you guys probably can, you know, attest for those of you who are on social media to being on there and just scrolling forever. And then you're on somebody else's page. And then you're on somebody else's page. And then you're on this random person's page. And then you're watching this video of a kangaroo, a random person, you know, like, it just gets like that. It's a vortex. It sucks you in. It sucks your attention, it sucks your mind, everything, and literally you could be having a conversation with someone you don't know in your mind on social media just because of the way that you're engaging in their life and in their world. Because people post everything on social media. They post when they woke up, how they had breakfast, and how they went, and you can tell people about their day and what they did, and what they wore yesterday. Hey girl, I saw you, and you went out here, and then he went over here, and you, and you don't even know this person in real life. And that's awkward. <laughs> that is so awkward. So my first thing, I know it's supposed to be more about the bullying side, but my first thing is protecting yourself, right? And protecting the content that you post so that you are not, you know, this um, vulnerable uh, person where you're sharing all of your intimate details on social media and you um, are placing yourself, you're exposing yourself in ways that could be private. Right? And so there's a difference between personal and private. You want to put personal information, my birthday was such and such, I did this, I did that. But then we have, you know, young people who are like, I had a hard day and this happened and X, Y, and Z and I had a fight with my mom and that's private. Right? And so being able to have 
this discernment, which really means like what Sheena was talking about earlier, this inner voice that you're listening to that is telling you, okay, this is okay to post, you know, like my birthday event, um, but what I am planning on doing, you know, in my private time, or what happened to me between me and a friend, that's private. And so being able to know what content you're posting in this social media world is super important because it also determines how people will engage with you and your page. And so for me, um, one reason why I can't attest as much is because I don't have a K after my followers, so my following is a lot smaller. Um, and so I think with the larger following is what opens up a lot of people to trolls because they're just random. And they don't really know you, which is sad that they would take time out to um, you know, comment negative things because it shouldn't be that kind of space. But it's important because what I think is happening a lot of times with young people, while for us, the followers are maybe people we don't know who are trying to attack us or bully us, I think for you guys, it's probably people that you do know. And people in your neighborhood or somebody who wasn't bold enough to say it to your face in reality, and they wanted to say it in the cyber reality. And so it's important that for you, that you don't get caught up in this alternate world where you're engaging in something that's not a real, it's not real, it's, it's, it's a fight that's not really happening because it's happening on social media. Um, so what's important is that you feel confident addressing issues that you have and conflicts that you have with people in real life, in real life. And that this world doesn't become, you know, this dark hole of a place where you kind of fall into and get guts and get, you know, muscles and excited to be able to say things because you're typing it and not verbally saying it to a person face to face. That's really different. Um, and so, I mean, I, I agree with the other panelists and there's some things that, you know, like, that you guys are experiencing and I just encourage you guys to not only to reach out to your parents because it may feel awkward, different, or weird, even though I do think that's important, but I do, I think you should be a leader too, you know, amongst your community and amongst your peers to be like, nah, I'm not with that and just drop it, you know, like, I think you guys have the fortitude and the strength to be able to lead in your community to just be like, nah, that's not me and, and leave it at that. Some things don't need to go big and be like, Mom, I gotta tell you, like, this is happening, it's going on. You can just be like, nah, like, don't respond, don't engage, block, you know, just do things where you just drop it, because, yeah, it's not possible. I wanted to say one thing, I wanted to say one thing that I forgot to say, and I think Keisha highlighted the point, so did she, and so all, all the ladies did. Um, at your age, there shouldn't be people that are following you that you don't know. One, because of your safety. There are perverts out there, there are stalkers, there are people that would just say, oh, she's gonna be in Ocean City next week. I'm going to Ocean City so I can stalk this girl. And maybe abduct her, whatever have you. Everyone, all the young people should go through their social media, see who's following you. If they don't look familiar, lock them. There's no reason that they're following you. You're not a social life. So there's no reason for them to be following you. So I encourage everybody to do that because of your safety. And you should just do that. Why would you want you know, at 13, someone following me that you don't know. He's a 62 year old. It's all about the followers. Yeah, delete the followers. There's no reason to have that. 100k followers. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's true. <laughs> I don't know.
physical changes, the emotional changes, the mental health is another important thing we need to pay attention to. I know we all are always at the doctor for physical. Mental is just as important. All right? Next, we're going to get into some juicy stuff. For women like myself and Gina, who have come from, and Molly, come from traumatic childhoods such as sexual abuse and rape, we tend to attract or are attracted to those who are dysfunctional and come from instability and, you know, traumatic backgrounds as well. So I found myself as a teenager in a relationship that I didn't realize was an abusive relationship until years later. It wasn't physical abuse, but, um, and my mom, my god mom, my grandma always pointed out, like, you guys spend way too much time together. He's always calling you. We're always on the phone with him. He always needs to know where you are. Little things like that are signs of an abusive relationship. And when you come from a rough background, you, you tend to put up with it more than someone else would. And you don't realize it because it's a comfort zone. Um, so parents, look out for your dating teenager who is spending way too much time with your partner, um, who seems to be being controlled by their partner, and um, who may also be fearful of their partner because there is such thing as um, relationship abuse, domestic violence, it is. It happens, you, your boyfriend punches you, he punches you on the wall, he chokes you, he, you know, gets angry at you for things that you didn't do anything wrong. That's abuse. He manipulates you, makes you feel low, he, he gives you no privacy. That's abuse. Parents look out for that kind of behavior. Um, at such a young age, you should not be that heavily involved with someone anyway. I always say, just like they tell boys and girls, play the field. Do not give up your vagina, but get to know different kinds of men. Like, date without physical activity. It's, it's awesome to get to know different personalities and different kinds of guys and, you know, how they think, how they operate, what their life are. Can I just add to that sex is like glue. So, what Jasmine is talking about, a lot of times when people are sexually active, that's that glue that makes you feel like you need to be around that person all the time because you've been so exposed and vulnerable to them and they see the inside of you. It just makes you more and more attached and that's that attachment that makes it hard to detach. So it becomes really hard to overlook some of the things and the behaviors that you may normally say, I would never be in a relationship with somebody who hit me or punched me or who cursed at me or who, you know, even ignored my phone call. But when you're attached in that intimate kind of way, your blinders easily can start to come up and you start to ignore certain behaviors that initially you probably wouldn't necessarily accept, but you have this, you know, this loop that kind of bound you to that relationship. So be careful. Yes, definitely. If we have two more questions, we're gonna wrap it up and start handing out gifts, taking selfies and just socializing and we just head out. Um, this question is, I just wanted to ask you. Right now is a very tough time for mothers and daughters during teenage years. I feel like it's like the toughest time of parenthood for mothers dealing with teenagers, especially teenage girls. Um, could you guys maybe share your relationship with your mother as a teen and where it's at now? And what advice would you give to well, me and my mom were really close. We all, my, we kind of like grew up together because she had us young. So, um, unfortunately, when we was little, my mom was at work all the time, so I didn't really have her to, um, you know, confide in or whatever. Like I was raised by like my great, my great grandfather's wife and my aunt who um, passed away. Um, I would like get dropped off at their houses, so a lot of my influence came from like other women. I'm strong, powerful, bond women, but just not my mom. Um, I think as I got older, when I had my son, me and my mom got really a lot closer um, because it was, we had something in common and we was both moms. And um, I, I just, my girlfriend has a daughter that's 16 and she was going through something with her. And I told her what I'll share with you guys to the parents and um, to the children. Um, I told my girlfriend, you know, like, recently I started looking at my mom as a woman first. 
Like, not as my mom, but as a woman, as I became a woman. And this is something that probably the, the girls won't go through until you're in your 20s or in 30s or whatever. But as a mom, you know, like, it's comforting. Like, I told my mom, like, you know, like, I just started thinking of you as a, a woman first. Like, you made certain decisions and certain choices because that's what you thought, was, you know, was right at the time. And you made a decision based on who you were as a woman. Once I started looking at my mom as a woman first, it, we started being more in, in tune and more friendly. Like now, I can go hang out with my mom and meet her for happy hour and stuff like that. But before that, I was just looking at her as my mom. Like, you think you know everything, you don't want me to do this because you're my mom. But eventually, that, you gotta look at your mom as just like a woman. Like all the things that you're going through, like the acne and anxiety and the puberty and the pressure, your mom would do that too. So sometimes they're saying it from a place of where they've been, and they're saying it from a place of like not wanting you to make the same mistakes that they did. Because probably if I listened to some of the band when my mom was talking, I probably would have had a son at 19, which I don't regret. But I probably wouldn't have, because my mom was telling me to get away from these older boys. But I wasn't listening, you know what I mean? So just start looking at your mom as a person first. And then like, you know, maybe she, maybe she do know what she's talking about. And you don't want to be 36 when you realize that. So try to like rem try to think of it now as, as a little girl. And as moms, you know, again, remember that she was once 9, 10, 13, and 12. So kind of try to relate to them on their level too sometimes and not just from a, I know better than you. Because we have to realize they're growing up at a different time than we did. Like my son is 16. I don't, I, I, I couldn't even fathom growing up when he grew up. Even though we, you know, I had friends that died and stuff like that, but it's different now. So, you know, I have to get in his head and sit on his bed some days. I go in his room while he's doing his thing and I go, what you doing? You know? Like, kick back with him. Try to get into their mind because they're they're growing up in a way different time than we exist. With way different, way, way different influences. There wasn't no social media. Barely had cell phones. Anything can happen. So, as parents, we have to try to, like, get on their level a little bit, but also give them room to make mistakes and not be like a know-it-all, but kind of like, let me help you when you fall type mom. And then kids try to remember that your mom was once your age, so some of the things that they're saying is because they know. relationships with your moms. 
like we all say, your mom has been your age before. Um, and you'll be her age one day. And like she does, I too, you know, in my 20s, start to see my mom as a woman and as a person. Um, and you're like, wow, okay, I can't believe she did this and did this and did this for me. And then you start to realize, um, and then you start helping her grow and helping her become more of a woman because of your strength that you saw from her or didn't see. So I would say be patient with your um, children, children, be patient, teens, be patient with your parents because they're learning just like you're learning to be a woman. They're learning how to cultivate a relationship with you, especially through this new generation with social media and friendships and boys and girls or whatever have you. So be patient, um, enjoy the relationship while you have it if you have a mom that's in your life. Value that relationship while you do. Everyone doesn't have their mom. Um, in their life, or an aunt, or a grandma. So value those relationships because they're not always going to be around forever. Um, it's sad to think about it at times, but make sure you can have those good memories to fall back on. So when you become a mother, you know what you want to do, what you don't want to do, but you can always reflect back and cherish those moments. I think everything that everybody has said has been really, really key and really important. I personally, I like cherish the mother-daughter relationship so much. I think even if it's, I think it's the woman-to-woman -woman relationship intergenerationally is so special. Even if it's, you know, like an aunt, like Ashley was saying, an aunt, a grandma, an older sister, a cousin, oh, whoever, because we have a lot of pressure. I know I said it earlier, but it's just, I feel so strongly about it as, as young girls and as women. We just are under a lot of pressure to just constantly be the best, especially as women of color. Like we're constantly just striving. We're trying to do the best, trying to be the best in every area of our lives. And that's a lot of pressure. And sometimes the you know mother-daughter relationship can sometimes feel like you're working against each other. Um, and so the more that in the household you can feel more like you're on the same team because you want the same things for each other, the better. Um, I remember my relationship with my mom growing up, I sometimes felt like we were not on the same team. Like, I just felt like she was doing too much or, you know, not enough. And, you know, like I didn't necessarily know how to ask her what I needed um, and, and tell her and vocalize, you know, like, actually I need you to do this. Because to be honest, when you're a teen, you don't know. You know, sometimes you feel like you want your mom there, right there, like, come in the bed, I need to talk to you, I need to tell you something right now. And then the next minute, you're like, go away, I don't want to talk to you, like, get out of my face, like, you don't understand what I'm going through. And it can be a lot, it can be a lot to manage, a lot to juggle. Um, and so I think, you know, as the more we can be empathic with each other, just understanding that everybody is juggling a lot. Mom is juggling a lot, trying to be mom, trying to work, trying to be there, trying to not be there, trying to, you know, make sure you feel supported, trying to make sure you don't feel like I'm a helicopter mom, trying all of these different kinds of things. And then, you know, as a young person, you have a lot going on in your mind, there's all these questions that people are constantly interviewing you and constantly asking you, what do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to do? And you're just like, oh my gosh, stop asking me because I really don't know, but I feel like I have to have the answer. Otherwise, mom's going to look at me like I'm crazy because we rehearsed this in the car, you know? <laughs> And you're just like, okay, get it together. It's just a lot, you know, it's a lot. And we're all people trying to just figure it out, right? I can't tell you, you know, we've all been in the professional field for a long time and we've had different jobs, you know, we've had different career paths. We've chosen to do different things. And so if we could just give each other the space to just live and grow and also communicate, like, listen, I'm here to support you, whatever you need. I remember really quickly at work they were asking us what do we feel like you know we needed when we were teens and I felt like I just needed somebody to care about what I cared about and sometimes that wasn't college sometimes that wasn't whatever it was like you know what I'm about to wear on Saturday you know I wanted somebody to care about you know what my hair is doing and how I look crazy or what you know what's going on with this pimple on my face or whatever or something that may seem so small or this class is really hard or I'm looking forward to school but there's this one person that I don't want to see you know things that may seem so minute um, but it's something that you know maybe in a young person's mind and so even just asking that question like 
what do you care about right now? I know in the grand scheme of things, you're a great kid and you're thinking about college, you're thinking about your next step, you're thinking about that. But like, what, what right now, in this immediate moment, like, what are you thinking about? Are you thinking about that test? Are you thinking about that teacher that's giving you a hard time? Or whatever. Um, so I just think that empathy and um, just, you know, relations um, and all of that is like really important. Put your cell first, travel, and Kina, what advice would you give? 
I would I would just piggyback on what I said in my first um, comment is to trust your intuition. Um, that little voice in your head, it, and, and sometimes it, it can be something simple like, should I buy this bag of Doritos? If it's a voice, that's God. That is your intuition. That is something that women have that's our gift. Every situation I've ever been in in my life that was bad, I didn't listen to that voice. So, you, and I know you hear it. You hear it all the time. Like, the pink shoes or the red shoes? The red shoes. And then you get the pink shoes and then the pink shoes don't look right. Listen to your intuition. It is a gift. It's not, it's, your mind is not playing tricks on you. That is, is, is a, it's a superpower. Listen to your intuition. I have gotten so many pickles in my life because I didn't listen to that little voice that told me no or yes, and then I did, or go, and I'm go, or don't go, and then you go. Like that voice, that intuition is so important. I'm, 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 I'm right now. I don't, I don't go against it. It could be something simple, like should I stop at Double Donuts on my way here? My little voice was like, don't stop, girl. So I kept going. Like I don't, and you have like I be running late for places, and I'm like, dang, I'm running late. And when I get to where I was supposed to go, it'll be this big dumb accident. And I'd be like, see, that's why I was running late. Like, that's your intuition. Something telling you to slow down. Something telling you not to do it. Or go to class, don't cut class. Or don't hang with that girl. Or your friend be like, come with me for this ride. And that voice be like, don't go. Don't go. I'm telling you, you're going you're gonna to be mad if you go. That intuition is so keen. We, we have it at three years old. That's what tell you to touch the hot fire. You know you're not supposed to touch it. So just listen to your, your intuition. Is that little voice is real? Listen to it because it's going to save you so much trouble if you do. I always tell myself to be patient. There's no rush to pay bills. A lot of bills. And don't be afraid to try different things. Like I know. Hello. I know right now you might think that you know what you want to be when you get older. I did too, and it didn't work out like that. I swore I was going to be a psychologist for football players. You know, it took too long. It's a great job. Once I realized how long I had to be in school, I'm like, you know what? Um, this isn't going to work. So try different things. I realized that I did like psychology, but I didn't like the sports part. But it took me changing my major like eight times for me to finally be like, I don't want to do none of this. So. Just try some different things, and I ended up just not going to school anyway. <laughs> so, um, I would say, hi camera, uh, the camera is right here. Um, Sorry. No, that's okay. Um, so I would say, be more patient with your parents. That's one of my biggest ones. I'm still actually learning that, being more patient with my parents, even as an adult. Um, money management. Jasmine said it, money management for sure. Um, and when you guys get to college, I wish I would have applied for more scholarships. Scholarships for college. Once you guys start preparing and getting ready for college, if you decide to go, apply for scholarships. There's so many scholarships. People are giving away free money, and I wish I would have done that a little bit more. In addition to that, while in college, I wish I would have saved my refund checks. <laughs> like, I remember one semester of getting close to $8,000, and I think I went to Miami. And me and my friends with the happy hour all the time. So save your refund checks, buy a car, save for a home. Um, so those are the things that I would say that I would tell myself to do. Um, I like what everybody said. So stamp in everything that everyone has already said. Um, but a big message that I would try to send to my high school self um, is that you are enough. Um, I think that the message of like worth and value is like so, so important. And if you can get it, the younger that you can grasp that you are so immeasurably talented, gifted, intelligent, you have everything that you need to be successful in whatever it is that you decide, that, I mean, that is so, so key. You are enough. And, and I think that had I known that, that I probably would have applied myself more because I would have felt less like I was disappointing myself or disappointing other people. I would have, you know, procrastinated less. I probably would have been less of a perfectionist in trying to make sure I had all the right answers to the wrong things. I probably would have applied for scholarships. I would have, I would have just been a little more grounded 
if I really believed in my heart of hearts that I was enough and that I could truly be as successful as I believed I could be in my day journey. Thank you. One more thing I want to say, and I'm going to open the floor for questions if anyone has questions. But one more thing is, girl, when you see another girl around your age, or older or younger, if you see something you like about her, let her know. Compliment her. Say, oh my God, I like your eyes. I like your hair. I like your outfit. Compliment each other because growing up, it was always being stared at. And then they will, someone will pay me, you're so pretty, I love your smile. I'm like, oh, thank you. It just makes my day so much better to get a little one little compliment, and I know why they were staring. It's because they like something they were staring <laughs> So compliment each other, stick together. I know this is difficult to find out. Stick together as women. We are so like powerful together. One thing that guys do, guys, is they play women against each other. We didn't really talk about this much. But a guy could be telling you one thing, you can tell this girl another, and you're upset because you're like, oh, she's crazy, he said this that about her, he's telling her the same thing about you. But y'all just automatically do not like each other. But if you come together and have a conversation, calmly say hi. Um, my name is Sister. Get to know her before you say anything that somebody said about her. You'll be able to tell a lot about her character, what's true, what's false. And then you'll still start gossiping about who you know, you'll get to know the truth and the lies, but never let someone tell you something about another person before you get to know them yourself. But um, girl power is real, stick together, communicate with each other, work together, stop giving each other up and down with the same faces, come together. It's, it's a powerful thing. Look at us up here. Like, amazing. These women, I reached out to these women and they were like, yeah, we want to work with you. Yes. Oh my gosh, I thought he was going to get on. No, check my schedule. They were amazing. They were open and they were here. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Does anybody have any questions? Any young women want to ask any questions? Are you struggling with anything? wonderful, wonderful thing that Jasmine is doing here. And I am so proud of her and all the other women that's here on this panel and feel that this community needs more of this and more you know, young girls. I mean young girls, but open up to young boys as well. Actually see this because there's not a platform that we can be comfortable in and that young girls and, and young men also, but young girls from now will be able to hear like really speaking out, I'm, thank you, thank you so much for really being open and honest. I had a mother that was as open and honest as um, she was. And had my mom not talked about, you know, penis and giants, different things like that, I would have probably been one of those ones that's been so embarrassed about those things. But I wanted to add something for parents, but me being a psychotherapist, a behavioral specialist, and um, a mobile therapist, and dealing with teens and children, that as parents, we also, I know it's, we have very busy lives. We are trying to provide for our children. We are trying to do things for our children, make the best for them. But sometimes just giving your kids all the time and just passing on stuff to them, it, it, it opens up a platform also for children to be able to feel neglected. So you feel you may have things you're giving your child this. Oh, my kid just got a new iPhone. So what? I mean, what are they complaining for or something? But you're, you're, you neglect it. That can be abuse as well. When you neglect not, not being able to talk to your children, at least if you can spend five minutes, just five minutes, it should be more. But if you can spend five minutes a day with your child and just be able to say, how was your day? Just simply, even in passing, how was your day today? What happened today? Is anything you need to talk to me? Not as just as a parent. We should always be parents. I do. I agree with being your friend to your kid, but let the kid know I'm your parent. At the end of the day, I am your parent. I'm not just your friend or something. But also being able to read our children. We a lot of people say, I didn't know my kid was like that. Yes, you did. You just was too busy to look at it and say, you know what, I had to check my kid. But please, please read these children. So many kids that I have to do therapy with that it's so hard to reverse those things, like all these issues that these women are talking about when a child gets 20 and 30. Where were you when I was 10? Where was you when I was 5? What was you doing at those, the, you know, that age? And even though we can't have an explanation of saying that, I was doing this. I was trying to provide for you. I was trying to take some time. We never get the time back.
back. You are never going to get the time back in these years back. With, I mean, a, a, a son that just turned 24 the other day, two days ago, wanted to turn 23. Now, that five, my five-year-old is here. And people always say, did you do anything different with your, with your 20, the kids that are 20-something years old, that you're doing different with your five-year-old? And I tell them, honestly, no, I didn't. I'm doing the same things. I'm taking him to libraries. I'm taking him to the zoo. I'm taking him just simply outside the walk and say, look, that's a tree. This tree has this. This tree came from this. If you planted the seed, you did. Take these times to do these things with your children because at the end of the day, you cannot, you will not get this time back to spend with telling your children these different things and, and, and the things that they have to go through. I, I mean, I'm almost 50 now. And, and looking back at things and saying, wow, I wish at this time I would have been able to. I, I had, a, you know, things were very good in my life because I did have a mom that sacrificed and took the time. But sometimes we, we just have to look at things and say, what could you do different? Also, young girls, I want you to start doing, have a journal and write down. If you write down, it, 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 it is different when you put something out in the universe and think about something. If you think about something negative, negative things are going to happen. But if you start writing down every day, challenge yourself, write down five positive things and five things that you're thankful for. Every day. It doesn't matter. When you get up, even if it's at the end of the day, make sure at the end of the day, you know what? I forgot to write five thankful and positive things about myself or what I'm thankful for. It can be simple as I'm thankful for waking up today. I'm thankful for my mom. I'm thankful that I, I was able to use my phone today or so, because some people don't get that opportunity, especially a lot of the things that's happening here out in our communities that, today. But kids just being bystanders, just being somewhere and things happening to you and you never getting that opportunity, a chance to become an adult, to go to college, to do a trade, to, to work, to have children, to get married, to have a family. So really, really, I uh, just want to also make a challenge to parents that read your children every day not read to them but read them because if you if you just took one second to look at how your child came in or how they got off a phone conversation you'll be able to know that something was wrong and something didn't happen so try to i, I challenge you to do those things and, and to really look into these things with your kids and thank you Healthy, it's unhealthy. Speak what you are feeling like for 